Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of this new tutorial series about implementing skeletal animation using OpenGL. In this series I'll be covering the basic concept of skeletal animation and explaining the code and the maths required to implement it, and I'll also show you how we can import animations and animated models that have been made in 3D modelling programs. For this series you won't need to have any prior experience with animation, and you don't need to have followed any of my previous OpenGL tutorials, but you do already need to have a good understanding of the modern OpenGL pipeline with shaders and VAOs and VBOs, because I'm going to be taking all of that knowledge for granted in these tutorials. The full code for this entire series can already be downloaded from the description below, and you'll also find a readme file which will explain how you can get it set up in Eclipse if you want to. And obviously I'm using Java for these tutorials, but all of the OpenGL code and animation concepts that I'm going to be covering are easily transferable into other languages if Java isn't your language of choice. One thing that I'm not going to be covering in these tutorials though is the creation, rigging and animating of 3D models in Blender or any other modelling software. If you're looking to learn more about that side of things, then I've put a link to a very good tutorial series about doing just that in Blender, and I actually use those tutorials myself to create and animate this character that I'm going to be using for these tutorials. So first off, let's talk about what skeletal animation actually is, without going into any specifics about implementation. An animated model has two main components. There's the skin, which is just the 3D model, the mesh of vertices, and then there's the skeleton, which is made up of lots of bones, or joints, as we'll be referring to them in the code. Moving a bone also deforms the vertices around that bone, which makes it very easy to put the model into different poses like this. And of course, the bones aren't actually something that gets rendered, they just provide us with an easy way to manipulate the model. An animation is then just a series of poses at different times. So for example, I could say that I want the model to have this pose at time 0, then this pose at time 10, and then this pose at time 40. If I now run the animation, it looks like this. So I only specified the model's pose at three specific times during the animation, and then for the rest of the times, the pose was determined by simply interpolating between those poses, moving smoothly from one pose to the next in the available time. These three points of the animation where I set a specific pose are called keyframes, and so an animation is simply a series of keyframes, and a keyframe is just a specific pose at a specific time of the animation. So this here is an overview of the animation code that we're going to be looking at in this series, and in this tutorial today I'm going to be giving you a summary of all the different sections involved to try and give you a general understanding of the concepts that are being used here to implement animation, and then in the upcoming tutorials I'll be covering each of these sections in much more detail, and I'll explain the specific code and maths behind each one. So let's start off this week by having a look at how an animated model is represented. As we've already seen, an animated model is made up of two components, the skin and the skeleton, and as we saw a minute ago, the skeleton is made up of multiple bones, or joints as they're called in the code. I'll be covering the implementation of joints in a lot of detail in an upcoming tutorial, but for this week I just wanted to talk about how all the joints in a skeleton are arranged in a hierarchy, and that each joint can have a parent joint and multiple children joints. For example, the hand joint in this model is the child of the lower arm joint here. When a joint is moved, all of its children move with it, so when I move the lower arm you can see the hand moving with it, because the hand is the child of the lower arm, but I am still able to move the hand without the lower arm moving. As another example, this chest joint here has three children, the neck joint and both upper arm joints, so when I move the chest, all of the descendants of the chest move as well. And of course, there has to be one joint that has no parents, and that every other joint in the skeleton is a descendant of, and that joint is called the root joint, and in this situation, that's the hip, so when I move the hip, you can see that the entire model moves. So for this model here, this is what the joint hierarchy looks like. So in the code, each joint is going to have a list of all its children joints, and among other things, each joint will also have an ID, and a matrix transform, which is basically the current position and rotation of the joint. So by changing the transforms of the joints, we can change how the joints are positioned, and therefore by changing these transforms, we can put our model into different poses. The skin for the animated model is just the mesh data and all the vertices, which as always we're going to be storing in a VAO where each vertex has a position, a texture coordinate, and a normal. 
However, each vertex of the mesh does now need some extra information in order to be animated, and that is information about how it should be affected by the joints. A lot of vertices in the mesh are only affected by one joint, so for example this vertex here is only affected by the lower arm joint, so when the lower arm joint is transformed, the vertex is transformed in exactly the same way. Moving other joints in the body has no effect on that vertex. Some vertices in the body however are affected by more than one joint, so for example this vertex here is affected partially by the neck joint, partially by the upper arm joint, and maybe even a little bit by this joint as well. So in the VAO, each vertex is also going to need to have the ID of each joint that affects it, and we're going to say that each vertex can be affected by up to three joints, and so this attribute is an integer vec3, which obviously can hold up to three ints, or three joint IDs. We also need to know how much the vertex is affected by each of these joints, and so for each joint that affects the vertex, we need a corresponding weight value. And that attribute is going to be a VEC3, because each vertex can be affected by up to three joints, and we need one weight value for each of those joints. Of course, all this skeleton and skin animation is totally useless without some code that can render our animated model onto the screen, and that is where the renderer comes into play. The renderer's job is to take in an animated model and render it onto the screen in the pose determined by the joint transforms. The joint transforms are going to be loaded up to the vertex shader in a uniform array, and the information about how each vertex is affected by those joints obviously comes from the VAO as per vertex attributes, and then the vertex shader calculates the deformed position of the vertex by applying the transforms of all the joints that affect it, and by basically taking a kind of weighted average of the resulting positions. And that is really the only new part of the rendering process, everything else can stay pretty much the same as always. So, so far we've got an animated model that we can put in any pose by changing the transforms of the joints, and we have a renderer that can render that animated model in that pose. Let's now have a look at how an animation is represented in the code, and this is definitely the simplest part of the whole system. As we saw earlier, an animation is simply a series of keyframes, and a keyframe is just a certain pose at a certain time of the animation. And a pose can just be represented by a transform, or a position and rotation, for every joint in the skeleton. So if a model has 10 joints, then a keyframe is obviously going to have 10 joint transforms, one for each joint. One important thing to note though is that these transforms are in relation to the parent joint, rather than in relation to the model's origin. So for example, the transform for this joint would not be the model space transform, which would be in relation to the model's origin, but it's instead this transform here, which is the position and rotation of the joint in relation to its parent. This makes it easier to interpolate between poses, as we will see in an upcoming tutorial. However, each of the joint transforms over here that we were talking about earlier is the model space transform required to move the joint from its original position to the position in the current pose. And this is obviously so that when you use it to transform a vertex in the vertex shader, it transforms the vertex from its original position in the mesh to the position it should be in the posed mesh. And the vertex positions are of course in model space, in relation to the model's origin, and so that's why these joint transforms need to be in model space as well. So obviously at some point between here and here, these final joint transforms are going to have to be calculated, and that is something that I'm probably going to be doing an entire tutorial about, because when I was working on animation, it was these matrix calculations and these different spaces that were the hardest parts to get my head around. So let's just recap quickly. We currently have our animated model, which we can put into different poses by changing the joint transforms, and we can render it in that pose by using the renderer, and we now also have a way of representing an animation. So obviously what we need now is some system to go in between that can apply an animation to our animated entity and that is what the animator class does. So the animator's task is to run through an animation, and each frame it needs to find out what the current pose of the model should be based on the animation, and it then puts the animated model in that pose by setting the joint transforms. And of course, the renderer can then render the model in that pose. To do this, the animator of course needs to know the current animation that is currently being carried out, and it also needs to keep track of the current time of the animation, so that's how far through the animation it currently is, and it increases this time every frame so that the animation keeps progressing. When the time gets bigger than the length of the animation, it sets it back to zero so that the animation plays from the beginning again.
For any given time in the animation, to find out what the current pose should be, it gets the previous and next keyframes, and it interpolates between the poses at those keyframes, based on how far the animation currently is between the two keyframes. To interpolate between two poses, the position and rotation of each joint needs to be interpolated. Interpolating between two positions is very simple, and you can just linearly interpolate for each of the x, y, and z values. Interpolating between two rotations, however, is a little bit trickier. Up until now, we've always represented rotations in my other tutorials as Euler rotations, but if you try to linearly interpolate between each of the components of two Euler rotations, you won't get the results you expect, and in most cases the object that you're rotating will take a very weird route to get from the start rotation to the end rotation. It's actually very hard to interpolate between two Euler rotations in a way that would give us sensible looking results, and so we have to use a different representation of rotations for the joint transforms at each keyframe. The rotation representation that we're going to be using is quaternions, and I'll be going into these in much more detail in one of the upcoming tutorials, but basically these can represent any rotation in exactly the same way that Euler rotations could, but you can very easily correctly interpolate between two quaternion rotations by using a method called slurp. And once we've interpolated between two quaternions to find the joint rotation for a given pose, it's also pretty easy to convert the quaternion rotation into a rotation matrix, which we can then apply to the transformation matrices when we calculate these final joint transforms. So once the animator has calculated the current pose by interpolating between the poses at the two keyframes, it then applies this pose to the joints of the animated model by calculating and setting those joint transforms. So that is pretty much the entire animation system. We have our animated model, which we can render in any given pose by setting the joint transforms. We have our animation, which is just a list of certain poses at certain times. And we have our animator, which runs through an animation, finds what the current pose should be by interpolating between the previous and next keyframes, and applies the pose to the animated model by calculating and setting those all important joint transforms. There is of course one final piece of the puzzle, and that is the loaders, and we need one loader for importing animated models, which is all the skinning information and the skeleton hierarchy, and we need another loader that is capable of importing animations and all the data about the keyframes. And that will then allow us to load up animated models that were made in 3D modeling programs such as Blender, and we'll also be able to animate them using animations that were created in Blender. And in the example code that I've provided, you'll notice that I'm using Collada files for both the model and animation data. So over the coming weeks, I'm going to be doing some more tutorials on the individual parts of this system, and we'll have a much more detailed look at the specific code and maths that's involved with each of these sections. But already, if you have a look through the source code that I've provided, and especially through the animation parts, you should already be able to understand the general idea of what's going on based on the stuff that I've talked about in this episode. And if you have any questions at all about anything that I've talked about in this episode, then please do leave a comment or send me an email, and I'll try and clarify things for you. For this week though, that is it. Thank you guys very much for watching this video. Do subscribe if you haven't already. Have a wonderful week, and I will see you all next time.